Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Demetra Nightingale, and I direct the Urban Institute's Federal Evidence Forum. And I'm really pleased to welcome all of you who are joining us today from across the country and a few even from other countries in this uh, next in a series of public but still virtual forums related to evidence-based policy and programs. Today's uh, event is jointly hosted by the Urban Institute and Pew Charitable Trusts, and Pew has been a great partner on evidence. The Evidence Forum is generously funded by the Annie E. Casey Foundation and the William T. Grant Foundation, and we thank them for their continuing support. First, a few housekeeping notes. Uh, this event is being recorded. The recording and relevant links will be posted online uh, after the event. All of uh, participants who joined us today are muted. And we have um, also have closed captioned uh, turned on. So if you'd like to adjust your settings for closed caption, click the live transcription button, which is usually at the bottom. Type any uh, questions or comments that you have into the Q and A uh, box. Um, uh, Any time throughout the event, we'll be collecting and trying to address them as we go along, or possibly we'll address them in future briefs or future events. If you would like to join the conversation on Twitter, please use the hashtag hashtag live at urban, which is on the bottom of this slide here. We'll also be sending a very short feedback survey to all who registered. So um, please take a minute when you see that uh, survey come to you to reply to help us decide on future events that would be useful for you. We have a great uh, but jam-packed program today. And before turning it over to our first speaker, Lawrence Supley of the William T. Grant Foundation, I want to quickly say just a couple of words. The 2019 Foundation for Evidence-Based Policy Act requires nearly all federal agencies to um, have or strengthen their evidence-based uh, structures and approaches. As you'll hear today, there are many different types of evidence and all of them have value. Formal program evaluations, performance measurement, statistical and data analysis and experiences of agency staff and managers, people and service providers. Today, we're focusing um, more on the use of evidence and the users of evidence, how various types of evidence are used to make various types of decisions. For example, in budget and policy decisions, program improvement, technical assistance, whether or not to uh, adopt evidence-based practices and in setting uh, research and evaluation agendas. As many federal agencies are now grappling with strengthening their evidence capacity and their infrastructure um, for rigorous evaluations, we want to turn slightly to the various ways evidence is or could be used at the federal, state, local, nonprofit levels, in the foundation world, and by service providers and people and groups that they serve. We have a great set of speakers and panelists. After Lauren uh, provides us with some context on the use of evidence, uh, Molly Irwin, Vice President at Pew Charitable Trust will introduce and moderate the uh, panel. After the panel, we'll hear from Diana Epstein who leads the evidence unit at the Office of Management and Budget and Vivian Tseng of the William T. Grant Foundation. Again, thanks for joining us today. Uh, please submit comments and questions. We want to hear from you. And now I'm going to turn it over to Lauren Supley. Lauren? Great. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to speak today. I'm excited to help set the stage for today's discussion by sharing briefly what the field has learned to date about how research evidence is used in policy and practice. There are many conversations about building evidence, but often we don't share about how uh, uh, research on how, when, and why research is used. I'm gonna give you a 30,000 foot overview of how various policymakers and practitioners use or can use evidence to make decisions to improve results and what makes evidence most useful. I'm drawing heavily on over 12 years of research um, that's supported by the William T. Grant Foundation on how to understand and improve the use of research evidence. We often hear in discussions whether research is used and we think of it as a linear process. 
where you can see research moving from point A to point B and the creating research and then applying it to a decision. When in reality, it looks more like this, which is a web of many different people and influences, only one of which is research influencing decision-making. Though it's true research evidence is often missing in discourse, it is frequently used if you know where and how to look at this web. While there are many different types of evidence used in decision-making and implementation, clinical expertise, client input, administrative data, survey data, performance metrics, and program evaluation, I'm gonna clarify some terminology that when I'm using the term research evidence today, I'm focused on the type of evidence derived from applying systematic methods and analyses to address predefined questions or hypotheses. So this includes descriptive studies, intervention or evaluation studies, meta-analyses, cost-effectiveness studies, studies conducted within or outside of research organizations. This does not mean that to suggest that I think any of the other kinds of evidence um, are not valuable and important. It's just that the research that I'm sharing today focused on research evidence with that definition in mind. I mentioned on the last slide that research is used in policy and practice, but what does it look like? Carol Weiss developed a typology of research use that's helpful in discussing research on research use to support theory and measurement. The typology has now grown and as the field has matured and we've learned more. Often, because researchers are linear thinkers, we think research is being consulted in the course of a specific decision. So when, what program to adopt, what client to prioritize, and how to train or motivate workers. When we ask if, if research has been used, we expect that the, course, the respondent will say exactly what they used and when they used it, with a clear and timely relationship between the research produced and what happens next. This is typically referred to as instrumental use in the Weiss typology. At other times though, research is used for strategic purposes. So knowledge from existing bodies of research evidence may be used to support a point or research from within a school district might be used to argue for a particular course of action or to justify a budget request. The, the use of research evidence can be more subtle and can shape ideas. This is known as conceptual use. Some research suggests that conceptual uses of research seeps into discussions and may be evident when you, decision makers attend to certain ideas or offshoots of those ideas. Conceptual use doesn't just inform one decision, but it influences what topic is prioritized or how someone thinks about a problem. And then this in turn influences policy actions or problem solving decisions across an entire agency or a system. Often though, this type of evidence use is more difficult to see. One of our grantees, Karen Bogenschneider, she's done work studying the use of research in state legislatures, and she's identified new and different ways of using research, including earning the respect and trust of your colleagues as the go-to person with knowledge on a particular topic. Policymakers also noted that they use research to educate their colleagues, constituents, or the press on a particular topic. And they used research evidence during, to enhance their debate or dialogue about a specific issue or to help reach a compromise. Hopefully, many of the ways research is used can be seen in your own day-to-day -day work. Evidence may serve different roles in the policy process. And when I'm using this term policy in this presentation, I'm being inclusive of proposed legislation in a legislative branch, formal policy regulation or information, information memoranda, or day-to-day -day decision making on how to shape a project or provide guidance to a state. The policy process often includes multiple stakeholders, including advocates, legislators, policy, political leadership, career staff and programs, and federal research and academic researchers. And evidence may emerge in their understanding to understand the context, scope, and causes and consequences of problems. It may help assess if a policy option is producing the intended goals, or it, help, it may help broker relationships to build consensus across these uh, stakeholder groups. So research is used in many different ways. Under what conditions is research more likely to be used? Trust. Trust is key in the use of research evidence. Trust means both building trust in the research itself, as well as the individual sharing the research. Often trust is lacking because of misunderstandings between different disciplinary cultures and norms. So Karen Bogenschneider's work again found uh, that policymakers, practitioners, and researchers often come from different professional training and cultures with different norms and beliefs. 
the context of policymaking has different timelines and priorities when then research production culture typically has. And this often leads to misunderstanding or stereotypes which can get in the way of creating more useful research and the use of research in policy and practice. Intermediaries are individuals or organizations that sit between researchers and policy and practitioners. And they're sometimes referred to as boundary spanners or knowledge brokers. They may be embedded within an organization, such as a research office in a state agency. They may be in a professional association, advocates, think tanks, consultants, or technical assistance providers. But they're often becoming these trusted partners that are able to share research to respond to an emerging issue. Our grantees, Lorraine McDonald and Stephen Weatherford's new book highlights the importance of understanding the different intermediaries in the policy process to understand that intermediary's purpose for using research and their underlying organizational incentives and how that might affect the, their choice of what research to use. This knowledge can help explain why and under what conditions research is used in policy. We often think if we build it, they will come but just pushing information out through dissemination does not mean it's getting used. Research on the use of research evidence has found to get research used requires a deliberate supported process, such as a partnership or a coalition. For research to be used, it needs to be embedded within existing organizational routines and supportive organizational cultures. Research has been found in organizations who are likely to have high absorptive capacity, which means an organization's ability to recognize the value of new information, assimilate it, and apply it. There are factors that foster absorptive capacity in an organization, such as staff that have relevant knowledge of to know when and how to integrate new information, organizational communication pathways that are both formal and informal to share relevant information within and across units, and strategic leadership to identify relevant knowledge and link it to the current need. And these dimensions are not additive, but instead they interact and work in combination with one another. A nice summary of what we've learned about when research is used is found in something called the three R's. So we've learned research is on the use of research evidence, it's most likely to be used when it's responsive meaning that the research evidence is timely, relevant to users, and matches open policy windows. It's routinized, meaning that there are ways research evidence is integrated into existing routines or decision-making processes. And it's relational, meaning that it's more likely to be used when it's in the context of a trusted relationship. In the decade plus since the foundation has been studying the use of research evidence, we've also learned there are specific methods and measures for studying evidence use. Some of this knowledge is collected in this monograph by Drew Detomer and Kevin Krauss entitled Studying the Use of Research Evidence, a Review of Methods. And this is available for free download on our website. And in this, they review some of the most common study designs that we see in these, in these research studies, such as social network analysis, experiments and quasi-experiments and case studies as well as the most common data collection methods, um, such as interviews, surveys, observation, discourse analysis, and document analysis. I'm gonna end my comments today with three examples from our grantees that are studying ways to create the conditions to make it more likely for research to be used. So the first is building off of those three Rs and the findings over the last decades, the Research to Policy Collaborative it aims to build situations where research evidence that's shared is responsive, relevant, and embedded in routines. The model builds relationship with congressional staff to learn what topics are likely to emerge over the next few months. And then they identify researchers with expertise in those topics and train them on how to work with policy staff. And then they pair them up. And they're exciting new findings from a random assignment design found that intervention offices valued conceptual use of research more. They also were 23% more likely in intervention offices to write and introduce child and family bills that included research, and 20% less likely to introduce bills that were lacking research evidence when there was no difference between the conditions at baseline. And the second example is our co coordinated knowledge systems work. Coordination occurs when the right evidence is supplied at the right decision at the right time and is used by the people who need it. This idea has worked in other fields such as emergency management. 
Bruce Chorpita and Kimberly Becker feel that many models to facilitate the uptake of research evidence fall short because they address the use of research by improving dissemination tools and practices in isolation. This idea is now being tested in a randomized trial that if you give youth mental health providers embedded uh, research evidence into their routines through the use of algorithms that I'd help them identify the specific clinical need and an evidence-based strategy that addresses that clinical need that will improve outcomes for youth and engagement and services. And they're, they're, they feel that it's critical for these models to coordinate the technological, such as the evidence summary, and the social situation, such as the role and responsibility of a professional, integrated that into a new system. Their early results at looking at preventing youth from disengaging from services is extremely promising. And then finally, embedded within a larger NIH funded project, Auburn Stamer's grant is developing a module within leadership training uh, for mid-level managers to support their identified need to determine if during program implementation, if an evidence-based strategy that they're trying to implement is working for the kids they're serving, and then maybe to know how and when they may need to actually pivot and switch to a different strategy. The training she's developed is focusing on building these managers' absorbative capacity around acquisition, assimilation, transformation, and application of research literature for implementation and sustaining of effective services for children. This is a brand new grant, so we don't have results yet, so stay tuned for the results. Hopefully this gave you a great overview of what we've learned, and I'm now going to turn it over to the panel. Thank you. Thank you, um, Lauren, for that great background to get us started. And um, I'll turn it now right over to Molly Irwin from Pew, Pew Charitable Trust. Molly. Thanks, Demetra. Why don't the, the panelists come on up on, on screen? Um, Demetra and Lauren just gave us a fabulous overview about research evidence, how we, how we see it, how we understand it. And I'm really excited to be here today with this panel to talk more about how we are using evidence, what are some good examples and how we can do better. Joining me today, we have three fabulous panelists from different situations, from different organizational contexts. Clemencia Cosentino is the Evaluation Officer at the National Science Foundation. Allison Holmes is a Senior Research Associate at the Annie E. Casey Foundation. And David Yoakum is the Director of the Policy Lab at Brown University. And I'm really excited to have all of you here today. Um, in addition to the current roles that, that all of you are, are in, you have many years of experience in different contexts and different roles, and, and I know you will bring some of those insights into the conversation as well. I, I guess I'd like to start um, asking all of you to follow up a little bit on what both Demetra and Lauren touched on, and that is... Um, how, how decision makers use evidence. What kind of evidence do they use? Both Lauren and Demetra talked about program evaluation and performance metrics, using evidence to make budget decisions, to decide what works. Talk from your experience about how you or the decision makers that you work with use evidence. For what purposes? And what types of evidence do they use? And let's start with you, David, on this. Thanks, Molly, and hi, everybody. It's a lot of different ways you can imagine using evidence to tailor operations. So in Rhode Island, for example, as we were sending out letters to encourage folks to get their COVID vaccines, there was lots of questions about the right way to design those letters. So we would try out different versions and measure which one worked best and use that to scale it up. You can use it in budget decisions where you're actually looking at whether to expand or contract a program based on how it's performing. And you can use it for sort of generating awareness of where there might be issues. If you got good descriptive studies, for instance, and probably four or five other kind of uses, but maybe I'll leave it there. Very good, Clemencia. 
Thank you. So I agree. I would also add that they use it when we provide it and when it's available at the right time, um, because um, decisions are made all the time on the go. Sometimes we have a little more time, sometimes we don't. Um, and so I think we need to be set up to be able to provide, uh, as Lauren said, information that is actionable, but in a timely way. Um, and I think all kinds of, of um, evidence is used in all kinds of settings. I have seen it at NSF. I'm relatively new at NSF, I should say. I've only been there for now, believe it, I can't believe it. it's been a year and a half, but I worked with NSF before. So I saw evidence being used. I saw evidence being used, for example, to um, add, uh, to change, to redesign a program. Um, studies that were done and they realized that there were emphasis that were lacking, for example, in partnerships to increase research competitiveness of jurisdictions. And so a specific track was added um, to support that work. And so that was a, a decision that affected a, a redesign of a program. We've also, I've also seen decisions that, um, that have to do with improving how we implement the program. For example, the includes program had a developmental evaluation. And as, a, as part of that, the first cohort uh, we studied and we compared awarded and declined proposals um, to understand the ways in which the solicitation needed to be sharpened. So there was a clear understanding of what NSF was looking for, but also revisions needed to be made to the webinars for potential participants, but also to the trainings for the panelists that review those proposals so that they were better informed. So in that case, the program didn't change but the implementation of the program improved. Thank you. Great. Allison? Yes, hi. So I think those are really great examples that we've already heard. Um, just speaking from experience within the foundation right now, <clears throat> we use evidence and data in so many different ways, both in terms of like our internal operations thinking about things like around strategy development. And so that can build on evidence in terms of like performance measurements, as well as evaluation evidence to build on our internal strategies across programs and our grant making. We use that in terms um, for developing RFPs or other types of grant making. Um, we use, you know, for our tracking our grantees and performance measurement to make some decisions there as well. Um, we use a lot of data and evidence um, in communication to our board. So again, in terms of a lot of that communication and decisions that go into that as well. Um, we also use evidence and for decision-making for our external work and um, kind of external facing things. So for our advocacy work, being able to take existing evidence um, and again, different types of evidence. Um, I appreciated Lauren kind of naming the different um, types of evidence that we can think about there, but for being able to, to make change in policy to advance um, different um, types of advocacy. Um, when we're thinking about narrative change as well, um, when we're thinking about that, taking that evidence base to change the narratives in different spaces. When we're doing system change or community change, we're taking an existing um, evidence base in order to advance that work. We build on evidence when we're looking at program improvement, kind of looking go at a more micro level. So program improvement or measurement development, um, where that's kind of going down deep, but we're not existing, we're not taking that out of a vacuum. It's building on existing pieces of work that's there. Um, or even supporting networks or collaboratives um, it's taking, again, that existing evidence base and, and helping to, to push that forward. And we also do work around field building for learning agendas. And so that's, again, taking some existing body of work and evidence that's there and advancing that in, um, in a more collective. It stands for where learning needs to go. That's fabulous. I'd, I'd like to... Um... To, to follow up and Allison, you started talking about this, Lauren talked about it too, and take a step back and say, what do we even mean by evidence, right? There's data, information, 
evidence? What is it that decision makers need or what, what's the value added? What's the kind of information? And what are we even talking about when, when we use these words? Yeah, so there's, I think that's important to distinguish because there's not sort of one standing definition. So even being explicit when we're using that language and that people are coming from different backgrounds and using that in different ways is a really key step for that. So data could mean lots of different things. Evidence can mean lots of different things and kind of use that as a blanket terminology and providing that definition, creating that common grounding is a really important step when we're, trying, when we're entering into those conversations, particularly with decision makers. Um, and that those different types of data, whether we're talking about performance measurement or you know, evaluation findings, um, you know, or if we're talking about quantitative work or qualitative work, those are all you know, completely valid types of evidence that come from different sources. And we just need to, you know, again, kind of have that common definition. Um, but one point that I just wanna call, kind of call out is we're sort of creating that, those definitions is an assumption that we may bring into that and, um, and being clear that you know, data and evidence are not neutral per se. And we may have the kind of, I mean, it's important to sort of acknowledge the bias in our information um, because that directly impacts the conclusions and the decisions that are made with it and, and how or why those, um, you know, evidence may be taken up and used. And I think there can be a tendency to, to think of data or research or evidence as objective or neutral and it's, and it's not. And so I think that's just an important piece, you know, even as we're, again, kind of creating our common definitions and alignment of that just to sort of name that. Because at every point in the process, you know, there's a decision. So what questions are we asking? You know, how are we defining this data element? What, you know, what are we bringing into that research? Um, and though that cascades throughout our research process and into the evidence that we're creating, and that's not, um, that's not objective. That is not a neutral piece. And so I think that's just an important part is we're creating that definition to just name um, in that. Go ahead, David. Yeah, I mean, I think, tend to think of evidence as either having a kind of descriptive function, you're trying to describe how things are currently operating in the world, or a predictive function, you're trying to think about what will happen if I do you know, this policy or that one, this program or not. And in both of those cases, it's got some structure around how you're collecting that information. So evidence is typically not just relying on your immediate intuition, for example. It's something a little bit beyond that. I agree with Allison's point that you can you know, do these methods in, in better or worse ways and, and kind of chase your tail in some cases, but it's a structured attempt, I think, uh, to do those two things. And the other thing is not, what evidence is it, is on its own prescriptive. Like it can't tell you what to do on your own. Like you think even in language when we sometimes talk about, you know, what the science says we should do, even something like, you know, wearing masks amidst COVID, I would say strictly speaking, what the evidence provides you is some sort of estimate of how much wearing a mask will reduce the transmission of the disease. And you need to do some additional injection of some, some values around the trade-off of wearing a mask with its inconvenience and so on to come to a kind of political recommendation about a mask wearing policy. Really good point. So this, this conversation is fascinating. We, went, we just went through a similar one um, at NSF uh, because in the process of um, doing some, some work related to our learning agenda and to our capacity assessment, we realized that we were not speaking the same language, that people come from different disciplinary traditions and different work backgrounds. And they mean very, very different things, um, which is, I think, the essence of your point. I have to admit that I never thought as a blanket statement that data or evidence are simply not objective. I've always thought of we strive for objectivity, achieving objective, um, collecting objectively valid data and producing uh, valid and reliable estimates. And then sort of, but, but I get the point of thinking about reflecting always about whether we achieve that goal. Uh, I think that's a, that's a really powerful point. Um, what we found was that there was so much variability within NSF about the uses and I just opened up our evaluation guidebook 
that showcases this problem. And we've had questions like, where can I find data on the demographic characteristics of PI? Um, and people can mean literally raw data because they want to analyze it, or they can mean, I want to know the gender distribution of the PIs in my, in my program. So there is a wide range. As a, as a English, uh, English as a second language speaker, the first thing that I did was I pulled out my dictionary. And it was fascinating to see that the definitions provided in the dictionaries support all of the uses, all of the meanings of these two words. In other words, they're all perfectly legitimate. So I gave up what I thought I was going to do, which was I was going to try to bring a uniform definition across staff at the foundation by disseminating it and by engaging people. And then I realized, no, because we always have people coming and going, and this is never going to work. And it doesn't make sense since these are all valid uses. And we've transitioned into speak really clearly. Communication skills are very important. Explain what you mean. I have a meaning. To me, data means raw data. It means the individual level records or the institutional level records with data that we use and analyze. And when we analyze it, as David said, we produce a descriptive estimate of some sort. That's the evidence to me. And to me, it's very clear, but that's just me, right? It's perfectly valid to say, I, wanna, I want data. I want to know if my program, uh, I want data on the impact of my program. I hear that all the time. They don't mean data. They mean they want to know if we can produce a coefficient estimate that shows that their program had or did not have an impact. So anyway, I want to echo what everyone say. I'd, I want to say that I think that trying to come up with a uniform definition, it, it's not going to work because there's so many uses and so many different ways of talking across disciplines. But I do think that the point of being uh, cognizant of whether we are truly being objective, uh, given the data we analyzed or the, or the methods that we use to produce the estimate is a, is a really important uh, warning. Thank you. Thanks. So I wanna come back to this, this question of objectivity in, in a little bit, but but right now I wanna turn, turn back to a, a really nice point that Lauren made in her presentation. And that's sort of the, the three R's of, of evidence use. And she talked about the importance of evidence being relative to the, relevant to the needs of stakeholders, building trusted relationships and being embedded in routines. And, and I wanna maybe focus on, on all of those, but start with the first two and, and, and say, you know, I think we all know, we all agree that in, in order for evidence to be used in decision-making, it requires that decision-makers play a role in thinking through what those, those questions are and making sure that they reflect stakeholder needs. And there are many different models of doing that, many based on building trusting relationships between stakeholders. And I would love to hear from all of you models that you are using to bring stakeholders together to define evidence needs or models that you think may be promising that we should be looking at. So let's start with you, Allison, on, on that one. Well, I, I think that was such a great point. And I was glad to um, have that framed at the beginning of this uh, conversation. Um, just like a couple of examples that we're using in some work um, is, is really starting those conversations with stakeholders as early as possible in the beginning of, of work so that they are part of that process that you're, um, I think it helps to open up those conversations that you're not coming in with so much preformed, um, and that is, I think, opens up the opportunity for that trust building, like Lauren was talking about in terms of the partnership and coalition. But starting that earlier in the process, we found to be kind of a helpful practice. Um, and so some of those models can look like um, can take different forms. Again, depending on the work and in the context. There's not necessarily one solution to that. It, it really seems to fit and we need to have that flexibility depending on you know, the question, the work, the context, community context, all of those things. 
But one of the practices that we found um, that we've used in several cases is, um, is advisory groups. And again, how the depth of that and how to structure it is you know, dependent on that context and in the community. And they can be involved in different um, aspects of the work coming from developing the research questions itself, co-creating um, instruments, co-interpretation of findings. Again, that can be, um, can vary throughout the, the work. We, um, we also have some examples of um, participatory research approaches where it's um, much more in depth. Again, that may not be an option for, for all types of work, but that, you know, that could also be um, an approach to take. You know, sitting as a, a philanthropic uh, funder, you know, one thing that we also have an opportunity to do is, is actually just convening stakeholders outside of a research space to, uh, to have a conversation, you know, to create those opportunities for dialogue, um, especially when we're thinking about system change or collectively building learning agendas. You know, really just creating that space for that coalition building outside of a specific work, you know, before all of that work is happening in depth, you know, that's an opportunity um, in the funding space to create those, those opportunities there. Um, another opportunity, uh, you know, again, sitting as a funder is to create space in our funding mechanisms. Um, to do this work differently. Um, so bringing, bringing stakeholders together takes time and resources. And so making those adjustments in the, the funding, whether that's just adjusting the length of grants or you know, more flexibility in the, the grant mechanism itself can allow that, that time and space to bring the stakeholders together, however grantees may need to, um, in order to do that, that convening, to do that exchange, in order to understand how those different perspectives need to come together and let the work evolve how it needs to. So just having that flexibility within grants me uh, mechanisms um, is also a way to support um, some of that work going forward. So I can offer that. David, let's turn to you. Why? Well, I begin with the observation that a lot of the breakdowns in the use of evidence are very mundane and has to do with kind of the flows of bureaucracy. And so, you know, if you think about like the budget process in, in Little Old Rhode Island, for instance, that's a place where over the course of, say, you know, four months, if you're a budget analyst, you might consider some five to six hundred different decisions on everything ranging from job training programs to like coastal shrimping laws to you know, the re retrofitting of buildings. And so you often end up with these really tight windows of time with particular pieces of paperwork with particular sorts of meetings around them that if you miss inserting in the right ways at the right time evidence into that process, a funding decision gets made, a regulatory decision gets made and you missed it. And so I think from a kind of capacity building standpoint for the use and generation of evidence, models that are paying a lot of attention to the, the design of those bureaucratic flows and trying to elevate the internal capacity of government to do this is really, really important to the point where I think we pay a lot of attention to sort of building the evidence base out at, at universities and think tanks and things like that and underestimate the importance of that kind of absorptive capacity internal. And so I think models like the, the lab at DC, which the scientific team based out of the, the mayor's office in the District of Columbia, or North Carolina's Office of Strategic Partnerships, which again is this internal to government sort of entity that has a very deep sort of connections with the outside research apparatus, but by paying attention to those internal bureaucratic capacities, they can get a lot more out of it. I'd like to see more of that happening in the field. Great. Go ahead, Colin. Yeah, so that that the point that you made, uh, David, I think is a is a really important one that I want to emphasize. You called it knowing the flows. Um, we call it at NSF having a decision making roadmap. Is understanding when are things happening so that the evidence would be useful at that point in time. We don't want to miss the boat. And I think that that deep understanding, working out that deep understanding, is really important. Um, but going back to Molly's question that I think was really about how do we make sure that we are collecting the right questions, that we're speaking with the, with the stakeholders. And I would say that, that the strategy that we have been doing using, and, and I sit in the office of the director in the evaluation group, 
I would, I would, I, I think there are two words that encapsulate what we do. We leverage and we include. And the leverage part is, I have no shortage of questions. At every meeting, if, if, if I'm paying attention, there will arise a question that, that we could potentially pursue. It might be an evaluation question. It might be something we can answer for a lit review, or it could be a performance measure. But questions are being asked all the time. Uh, we were recently at a meeting of the National Science Board, and they asked a great question about climate change, which is something we've been talking about a lot. And I thought, wow, here's one great question for us to consider as we're thinking about developing our learning agenda. So to me, it's leveraging those moments to go to um, Alison's point about resources and then being inclusive, thinking about who has not been in the room or, or which rooms are out there that we have not been into and that we need to then use our resources to knock on some doors to make sure that we hear those folks out. So kind of this dual strategy of, of leveraging information that is right there at our disposal if we're listening and taking good notes with then being very strategic about how we use our limited resources to be inclusive. Um, in that strategy, one example is to sort of coordinate with other agencies. Uh, for example, OMB is facilitating reviews, joint reviews of learning agendas. So one EO reviews for another agency and, and we review for each other. It's, it's a really great uh, way to expose us to similar portfolios and questions that are being asked so that we can uh, think about, oh, look, you know, this is similar to what we're doing. Maybe we will tweak it or maybe we won't do it or maybe we will contribute to it in some way. So it's sort of leveraging those opportunities and then being strategic. Thank you. So, so let me follow up on that. Clementia, you just mentioned and, and Demetra mentioned at, at the top, learning agendas and learning agendas being a requirement of the Evidence Act and something that almost all federal agencies need, need to do. We have many folks, I think, in the audience from the federal government who are very familiar with learning agendas. We also have many, many people in our audience today that are coming from, from NGOs and philanthropic organizations and other places. Talk more, tell us what a learning agenda is and, and how, as a, uh, how it works as a model to define evidence needs and bring stakeholders together and how it works then to um, inform decision-making and, and evidence use on, on the other end. Uh, sure. So different people describe learning agendas differently. The way my take on a learning agenda, it's a research agenda. It's a set of research questions that if answered, will provide useful information for some stakeholder that we want to support. And some agencies have been using learning agendas for a very long time. Um, I think it was, it was uh, something that was taken up in the Evidence Act. And I do think that it was a great idea to do because it provides a strategic plan. It's a roadmap for what it is that you're going to do. And it enables you to plan, to get organized, to um, allocate resources, to think about how, you know, what, what you may need to get. You may need to get people with skills that you don't have, or you may need to think about what you can do internally versus externally. It is a great strategic tool, uh, meaning strategic planning tool. Um, at NSF, we have really embraced it. It was not used before. Um, it started being used a couple of years ago because uh, in anticipation of the Evidence Act being released. And, and we are finding that, that folks are very energized by it because now they get to participate in trying to get their priorities move up in, um, in the allocation of effort and resources by the agency. So they no longer just have to go and try within their directorate or within their office to get it prioritized, but here is a group in the office of the director that is trying to coordinate and they may elevate it by putting it in the agency learning agenda. So I think it is, um, it is a really great way to plan and, and then to, to know what it is that you're ex expected to do for the future. Where it becomes more difficult is in what we were talking about a minute ago, is how are you inclusive? I think that's the challenge of the learning agenda. 
Uh, we have not found that prioritizing questions is that difficult. We get tons of questions. Um, it is it, it, it is amazing uh, the, the, the number of questions that people have, um, but it is actually not so hard to use some selection criteria to decide this is what makes sense to pursue for us as an agency. What I think is a challenge is to truly be inclusive and make sure that everyone's voices are being heard and that we are bringing their perspectives back to the table. Uh, so that, that they are part of the conversation when we are sort of doing that priority exercise. Really good points. Allison, talk, talk a little, if you will, about the work that, um, that you're doing at the Annie Casey Foundation, bringing stakeholders together to understand evidence needs and use research to inform practice. I know that you have been doing some work in, in collaboration with the William T. Grant Foundation and the Casey Family Programs, really to understand needs to do, to do some surveys. Um, tell, tell us what you're learning there. Sure. Um, I just wanted to like add a note to what Quincy was saying in terms of that intentionality in involving stakeholders. I think that's reflected in some of the work we're doing as well. So just a plus one in that, in the, the shifting in practice and needing to like have that pause in your work and that and taking that reflection of who is here, who is not here. And we get caught up in our, our wanting to go and we have the question that we're wanting to answer. And so just to, to kind of give that nod and plus one that in other spaces we're, we're in that same, that same space as well, but the advantage and the opportunity for inclusion and how much that strengthens the work, um, I think is really incredible. So just wanted to give the, the plus one for, for that stream of thought. Um, but for the work that we're doing, um, at first, I just really want to acknowledge the great work and partnership the research team at um, Urban Institute provided. Um, it's been really incredible. So the collaboration with the Casey Family Programs and the William T. Grant Foundation, we developed a national survey of child welfare stakeholders to identify gaps in knowledge and research questions that need to be addressed to support youth and families. So we invited stakeholders from research, policy, funding, administration, frontline, judicial, and lived experience uh, through all of our existing networks. And it was really intentional to have a really broad set of perspectives um, because we didn't want to operate just in a singular silo and only have um, kind of one, one line of sight there. So the questions included things around um, estimating evidence gaps in a variety of topics, grading the highest priority areas for research funding, and identifying special populations that we knew the least about. We also conducted a series of follow-up interviews um, to capture the rationale for their choices and to help interpret the overall patterns. And so overall, we found the different stakeholders, so those that were connected to a child welfare provider or administration, um, versus the researchers, versus those who with personal experience did not share a perspective for what areas had the largest evidence gaps um, or what areas should be prioritized for funding. So for instance, we found that providers saw really large evidence gaps in agency policies and rules, while researchers found it was more evidence gaps around federal and state policies. And then persons who are connected to the systems, they saw the largest gaps for post-system involvement. So if you kind of sat in their places, you could maybe understand why they might elevate some of those areas. Um, we did see some convergence in the priority funding um, with an overall theme of prevention. But again, we saw a lot of variation by the respondents. So we've been, we're using these findings from the survey to inform a larger national research agenda project. And there's going to be more to come about that soon. So definitely stay tuned. Um, we're really excited about it. But overall, I think this was a really nice example of the importance of obtaining those multiple perspectives, um, particularly from those who we want to use the research findings and those whose lives are impacted by the systems or would be impacted by the changes to the system with this additional evidence uptake. Um, we could have been in a position where researchers are working on a set of things 
that the administrators are not looking for at all and that families are not seeing a need for either. So this really opens up the opportunity to intentionally shift and share power at the research table um, at the outset of the work and really doing that, building the coalition that, that Lauren was talking about earlier that we've, we've been talking about um, so that the evidence is relevant to the stakeholders on the back end of the work. So really building that at the beginning and doing more of that incorporation throughout. So at the end of the project, so right now we just have those descriptive findings that David was referencing, that later that we will have more of that uptake because they're seeing themselves reflected in that. We're seeing that relevance. And then again, we're bought in, we're sharing power throughout the process. That's fabulous. I'd like to tie a couple of these threads together and, and talk a little bit more about who are the stakeholders how do we broaden the group of stakeholders? How do we engage a broader diversity of people, perspectives, et cetera, on the front end? And how does that increase use, usefulness, and, and ultimately use on the back end? Allison, you talked about this. Clemencia, you talked about this a little bit as well. David, I'd like to turn to you to ask, about the role that policy labs, that academic institutions play, and to pick up on the point that, that you made about stakeholders um, in the policy sphere and, and tying those, you know, finding the intersection there. So there's a, there's a few things there. I mean, one thing I would emphasize again is the capacity issues and not underestimating how sparse and challenging it can be to be working within the bureaucracy in this space. So I think even on something like the inclusion front, it's, it's, it's very easy to imagine first, you know, are we actually having the right opportunities for people to come into meetings, to comment on documents? And like, we need to pay a lot of attention to that. But I would submit to you that you can do all of the, the stakeholder engagement if you, that you want if you don't have enough people internally to absorb that feedback to synthesize it, to use it, it's gonna feel like you're ignoring people that need to be paid attention to. And it's really, a, it's really an implementation problem more than anything else. And so I'd emphasize that. And then the, the other thing I would say here from the standpoint of trying to get right this, this, balance, of, this balance of kind of engagement with the, the various values represented across the various stakeholders, it's a very specific recommendation to to use pre-analysis plans if you're, you're not already. These are documents that write up in advance what questions you're trying to prioritize in a study, how you're gonna actually, you know, what methods you're gonna to use to try to answer it, what data you're gonna use. If you're really doing this uh, right, you're starting to, to kind of anticipate what tables and visuals that you're going to share out. And traditionally the these have been used kind of between researchers to avoid, you know, people getting a data set and then putting their thumb on the scales of the analytics to get a result that they want. But the thing that I've been pushing for is, is using these documents more and more for a kind of community political discussion about those value, those value judgments. So we did, we did a project in DC, for instance, evaluating the body-worn camera program of the police department. And before we actually ran any numbers, we did dozens of different community events at libraries with different advocacy groups and so on, talking about the anticipated study in a very public way, writing down the feedback and really tailoring the study to that. And the, the upshot when we released the results, and this is kind of coming to your point, Molly, about kind of how to increase sort of buy-in, was that by the time the results came out, I think what can often happen is, you know, people see a result and if they, they don't like it, they get activated to want to pick apart the method. And if they like the result, the method looks great. But if you think about the timeline of what I was just describing, where you're actually getting an agreement on the method before anyone knows the result, you sort of short circuit that after the fact quarterbacking in a way that you know, in DC, the study had lots of limitations. It didn't have all the results that everyone wanted, but there wasn't the normal arguing about the, the methods, the, the conversation instead pushed more quickly around what to do next. And I think that's a concrete example of using pre-analysis plans to sort of navigate these stakeholder engagement community balancing points that we keep hitting on. That's a great recommendation. What are other recommendations, other things we can be doing, strategies we can be using to increase evidence use? 
I would actually say, I mean, this is may sound too general, but I think know what your audience is as important today as when I first learned about it in graduate school um, or before. You, we actually have to right size our effort to what will be persuasive and compelling to the stakeholders whose needs we're trying to meet. Um, I have made the mistake in my career of, of doing the study that I wanted to do because I felt it needed to be more rigorous and taking more time and spending more resources and things that turned out were not valued. Not because they weren't good. I actually, I'm still convinced it was the right thing to do from the perspective of my information needs and my sense of what a solid rigorous study should look like. But I have made the mistake of doing more than was needed um, and taking longer than was optimal to do it because I wanted to do a more rigorous design. And so that is not useful to people. So I think that if we truly wanna be useful to others and we want the evidence to be used, we have to be much more customer focused. And it's hard for those of us who are researchers, evaluators to think of our work in that frame of mind. But when you think of it that way, I think you do much more useful work that actually gets used and is valued. And what I've learned is that what I do now is I do what I think people actually need, want, and I give them all the caveats, all the limitations. And I said, make sure you don't say that this is the impact of your program. I just gave you a descriptive data point. It's a simple outcome. This is what we observe over time. So people understand how to use the information better and understand the limitations. And then I say, and if you ever want this other sort of higher standard of evidence, let's talk again. And we will do that and I'll tell you what it will take. So I actually think that knowing your audience and knowing their needs and their timelines is really critical. I, I plus one for all of that. Um, when we're thinking, you know, and kind of coming back to some of the points that Lauren made earlier in terms of like that capacity of your audience to receive things as well, um, that absolutely matters. And so, because in, in some ways it's not just like what the evidence is, but it's it's how we're delivering it and um, like in the when, the how, like the messages matter, like kind of what you're saying, Claudia, like it's, we may have really great what, <laughs> but if we're, we're not delivering it in the way, way and, the, and the who also matters. Again, like in that trusted relationship. So messages and messengers, are really important and that is isn't always our training and so if you you know bring in the folks that you need to help you know shore up your messages um i think we've all kind of been inundated a little bit in terms of like how many infographics did you build into this you know are you using plain language and that may not necessarily be our training um but it matters for again, getting that evidence into the right hands in a way that it can be received and, and taken up by that audience. And in thinking about our messengers of who needs to be with you for delivering that, if, you know, when building again, that trusted relationship so that it is coming across. And other spaces we use um, terms in certain work about credible messengers. So that again, it is really connecting with who who is going to, um, who can really deliver that in a way that your audience is hearing that. Um, and that, that's just an important, again, taking that step back and putting yourself in the lens of your audience, whoever that may be. And again, it's, I think the, I think a key part in this is it's not the same answer in every context and that we have to make that adaptation depending on the work, depending on whoever that audience or that decision maker is to make that adjustment. That our work remains credible um, that we do the same, we, like we keep our rigor, we keep our credibility in terms of in building that evidence, but we make that adaptation so that it can be received and used and heard in the way that we want it to be. David, I'd, I'd, I'd love to throw a follow-up question to you. I know at, at the policy lab, you're thinking about how to clearly communicate about evidence and have been working to develop a template to help staff, staff do that. Talk about that a little bit. 
Yeah, so I'm a, I mean, I'm a psychologist by training. And so how people absorb evidence and talk about how we know things is a, is a space of just direct interest in how our brains are kind of built to think about this. And I'll maybe just give one example. There's a lot of directions I go in here, but there was a, there was a study that was done a few months ago that asked people how much they kind of even morally approved of an hospital administrator who did, who did one of two things trying to reduce infections in a hospital. And he wasn't really sure which one of these two things would work better. In one scenario, he tried both of them as a field experiment, which whatever one worked better, went with that. And the other one, he just arbitrarily chose one and did it. And the, the kind of shocking part on the finding here was that people seem to have more intuitive approval of the latter thing. Like, don't actually try to collect evidence, just like pick a thing. And I, don't, I read it, it's a good study, that's by Michelle Myers and others. And the kind of reaction I had in seeing it though, was that the way I talk about experiments if out of out in the field just involves a lot more sort of slow explanation of the rationale for an experiment. And including in particular, often trying to, to really press on whether we're not sure what works. And what I mean by this, I think often people have an intuitive flash of, we don't need an experiment because I actually know what works. And in that case, I agree. If you know it works, just actually do it. And so we ran some follow-up experiments, actually slowing down and explaining more clearly that like, no, 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 we really do not know which of these two methods is actually going to lead to the largest amount of reduced infections. We introduced some discussion of how you need to know, not just in like a binary way, but like how big of an effect size and what's it going to cost to do it. And in my experience and what we bore out in some of these follow-up experiments is if you really talk very slowly and get everyone on the same page about the state of knowledge, or in this case, not knowing really what to do, then you see the support for experiments come back up. And I think as, as researchers, we're often just too fast to sort of jump in there and say, we need an experiment and let's do it. And if you do that, you can get, you can get unnecessary resistance relative if you really slow down and explain those, those concepts. Fabulous. So we have a, a number of audience questions that were we unfortunately won't get to all of them. I still have far more questions than we have time for, but I do, I do want to get to some of them. And, and, and the first is a question about the volume of evidence. How do we sift through the volume of evidence? How do we help decision makers take a step up and look at a body of evidence and use that to make, to make decisions? D David, jump in. You look like you have a thought. <laughs> well, <laughs> internal capacity, again, matters a lot for being absorbent in the ways I was talking about before. The other thing I would say is there is this dynamic to where there's lots of evidence that's out there. And even if you're, you're talking about it clearly, a breakdown can happen in how well it fits for your local context. So there's a ton of studies on a job training program but it was all programs that have twice the budget and twice the staff that you do. And so you're asking yourself locally, well, what are the 50% of these components I can take out? And it's often just not known. And I think comes back to a state where one of the ways we solve this problem is actually having, to my mind, actually a lot more local experimentation and not thinking that we can just run, you know, a single experiment at the national level that's going to work for every community, but instead have some of that work that has some good theoretical principles, but a lot more ability at a local level to tinker around with things and have fast feedback loops on whether it's working. And then you're creating really localized knowledge for what to do. And, you know, right now we just, that's, that's a little, we're a little bit thin on that capacity as you go down from national to state to county to city in particular. And I think that's where a lot of the front of, of capacity building needs to be at the local level. Very good. Others on this question of volume? So I do think that we, we are inundated with information all the time. Um, and I think that we, it's part of our job to be really good consumers of what is out there. And then in distilling it, um, my new phrase that I use all the time is cut it in half before you give it to me. Because we use too many words and we just don't even have the time, let alone the, you know, the, the bandwidth to, to really reflect on all the evidence out there. I do think that as we share information, we need, uh, we need to spend the time 
to understand what is it that our leadership needs to know that will be useful to them, not showcase all of our work. We do great work and we wanna show it and we wanna share it, but we only have very limited time with them. So how do we use that time judiciously? So it's, it's being selective, picking and choosing those things that we think are gonna be most useful and compelling to that particular audience and then providing it in its proper context. Uh, David talked about uh, multiple interventions at different, uh, different locations. That's very true domestically and internationally, but it, it generalizes to all kinds of information. For every data point we produce, there will be another one that doesn't match or that results in a different finding because it is so different. So we need to figure that out so that when we provide our point estimate, we can explain what it means. Or when we provide our insight, we can do it in the context of those other insights and competing explanations. I think we need to be more humble and realize that there are competing explanations, there are competing analysis, there are competing estimates. And we need to understand that to properly contextualize our work so that others can consume it. And if we don't do that, then we lose credibility because someone will point it out and then it will not be used. Um, so we, we wouldn't have succeeded. Thank you. I'll just quickly add like internally, <clears throat> we'll have the conversation of, you know, what, what do we already know about a question um, with like that new question comes up to really understand that existing knowledge base because a hundred percent we are not lacking in data or evidence. We are steeped in it. And so to kind of turn that lens to, so what do we know and what can we say about that? And so what is that, you know, what is the gap? What else needs to be filled, but to have a better understanding of what is known before digging into new work and being able to, uh, you know, again, plus one to what Clincy was saying in terms of being able to communicate that out to other stakeholders, um, but really having a clear gas, grasp of what, what, it, what, what do we already know about this existing knowledge base? Yeah, I think really, really good points. I think we've talked a lot about how do we develop a, 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 an agenda that's relevant? How do we increase use? But it's, it's this, um, how do we build capacity among the intermediaries, among folks like, like all of you to synthesize the evidence and then package that and communicate that in a way that it's helpful to, to decision makers. And that's, that's a muscle that I think we're all still, still building. I, I guess I'd like, we're almost out of, of time, but I do want to ask a final question about measurement. We're talking about research. We're talking about evidence use. Lauren talked about some of the studies that have been done looking at um, and thinking about how to study the use of research evidence. How, how are we doing that in all of our offices? How do we know if, if research is being used? How do we measure that? What's, what's the sign of success, I guess I will say? Well, I'll give one beginning with what I don't think is a good enough metric, which is just looking at decisions or legislations that cite to particular papers and then being allured into thinking that your paper actually tipped the decision. I just see this happen all the time where it'd be so nice if that was true, but a decision was actually made and then the supporting evidence was found. So I actually... I actually want to see some evidence of a, a decision that was actually changed because of the insertion of some piece of information. And you know, one way I'm tracking this now, using those pre-analysis plans that I was talking about, is kind of in the direction of, if we've come up to an agreed upon method with some articulation of, we're going to do X versus Y as a function of finding A versus B, when A gets surfaced, do we in fact do Y or not? And you know, being able to use that metric requires this longer process that I'm describing, but I think we need that kind of rhythm to, to be able to get good traction on the kind of counterfactual of what choice would have been made you know, if the evidence hadn't been there. Very good. Go I ahead, like that idea of 
Yeah, I, I don't think I have like a great example for like what is. So I think this is a, a like an area that's really ripe for some exploration. Um, but one idea to put forward as we're kind of in the, that exploration is for generating measurement that again kind of centers the people whose lives we're trying to impact and like, is this meaningful? Um, so when we're thinking about making that that change and um, you know, is the is the use of evidence meaningful in the in the in the change that's being made? So and I'd be really curious to hear like community stakeholders feedback about a measure of like applying evidence that only indicated like a statistically significant difference, but not like a meaningful or a practically significant, you know, difference like in their lives. So just kind of applying that lens when we're trying to think about how we're using that evidence and um, kind of capturing that aspect of it as we're trying to define some of this measure as well. Very good. Go ahead, Clementia. No, I was just gonna say, I, I'm too new at NSF to have tackled that one, uh, to be perfectly honest. Um, there's, there's a lot of work that needs to be done and I haven't, thought through about how do we measure, because you said measure, we've certainly been looking at use. Uh, and we've been looking at use in, 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 in two different ways to learn about how the evidence is being used. We're looking at use in, in the sense of trying to learn what was useful and what was not useful as reflected by, well, we followed up and now we learned how the program used this piece of evidence that was created so that we can come up with some sort of best practices. What was it that enabled the use? We've also been learning about use in uh, considering uh, as part of sort of evaluability assessments, whether we will take on a question. So somebody will come to us and say, well, we wanna do a study of X and then we'll, we'll, we'll ask questions about it. And as part of that, we will ask about what they've done in the past and what changes were driven uh, were made as a result of that. And we're trying to keep this information. But as I think forward, if I wanted to create metrics of use, um, it would be very difficult in the sense that, um, first of all, priorities change all the time. So I do realize the valid point David makes, oftentimes the evidence is used to justify a decision. It's not that the decision is made because of the evidence so the direction of causality is wrong. Um, I would argue that it's still useful, um, but, but I, I get his point, which is very valid. Um, but think about it, evidence, information gets used in ways that oftentimes cannot be measured. It influenced thinking. It turned somebody into considering something that they wouldn't have considered before, and it opened up the space for a conversation. That would be very influential. But I wouldn't have a decision that I can say was made because of that. So I think I would have to reflect on it quite a bit. But in all fairness, I think we would, over, um, we would often run into that issue of under and overestimating depending on what type of use was, uh, was the target of that particular piece of evidence. So we are coming to the end of our time. And what I'd like to do is throw out one question for each of you to answer just in a sentence. If there is one takeaway from today, one thing that, that, that folks who are listening can do to increase the use of evidence, what is it? And let's start with you, Allison. I'd say <clears throat> consider listening to your stakeholders um, and be open to shifting your practices in some way and trying something new. David? Go local by signing up for your mayor's, counties, states, executive orders, news feeds, press releases, and things like that, and monitor it so that when you see a topic being discussed that's relevant to your research, you can drop a quick email and offer a chat for five minutes. Or if you see a local politician run an experiment, send a shout out of praise that you encourage more of it. Clemencia. I, I think it's a really hard thing to say one thing, but I would say be a good listener. Um, I think that we think we know and we have great ideas and I'm sure we all do. But 
but again, we if we want the work that that we produce to be useful and relevant, uh, we need to listen to people and try to really understand what it is that they want and they need. Um, so that would be my my piece of advice. Thank you. Very good. And with that, I want to thank you all for a fabulous discussion. And we're going to turn it over now to Diana Epstein to talk and then Vivian to talk about what next steps are in the federal space and in the non-federal space in, in thinking about evidence use. Diana. Great. All right. Uh, thanks, Molly. It's a real pleasure to be here with everyone today. Um, and what a great panel. I was, you know, really excited and inspired by everything you all had to say. Um, you know, this has always been an important topic, but I think it's even more important now because of the increased interest and the momentum around evidence-based policymaking at all levels of government. Um, you know, and I can I can speak for a few minutes about some, you know, some, some really exciting innovations, I think, that are happening here at the federal level. Um, so, you know, as you probably know, the Foundations for Evidence-Based Policymaking Act became law um, about two years ago, over two years ago now. Um, and the goal was really to improve the way that the federal government builds evidence and then uses it for decision making. Um, you know, among other things, the law puts in place a more strategic approach to building evidence as opposed to the sort of ad hoc way that it's, it's happened in many federal agencies. And you know, this is meant to happen through improvements in data governance and, and strategic evidence building, things like the learning agenda that our panel talked about. And you know, federal agencies are right now working on developing those first full learning agendas, which are gonna be submitted uh, in the fall as part of their strategic plans. And I'm really excited about learning agendas um, for a whole number of reasons, but you know, for one and for the topic today, it encourages this deliberate and strategic planning of evidence building activities. And it emphasizes the need for collaboration across agency silos in order to really identify what those priority questions should be so that our, our limited resources are focused on answering the most important questions, the questions that are most likely to have results that are gonna be used. Um, and it also requires stakeholder engagement. So our panelists address this, um, and you know we mean internal to the agency and external to the agency. This this is by law part of the learning agenda process, and it's our hope that this will help to identify priorities at the outset for building evidence in areas that will be you know the most useful. Um, another, you know, aspect of this is that learning agendas are part of the agency's strategic plans. And we said from the start, they should be aligned with what those strategic goals and objectives are. And I think this alignment of evidence with strategic goals and objectives, it's a real opening to bring the evidence builders and the strategic planners together from the outset. So I'm very hopeful that this will offer sort of a new framework in which the evidence building priorities are aligned with strategy. And if they're envisioned together from the start, it will sort of elevate those most important questions, both the mission questions and the operational questions um, for which having empirical answers will help agencies to execute their missions more effectively and you know, ultimately um, serve communities better. So I, I'm also hopeful that this will generate more evidence that's useful and usable, um, as Lauren said at the outset, you know, responsive. But of course, you know, it's not enough to just build evidence as we've talked about today. We have to actually use it to improve policies, operations, and processes. Um, the Evidence Act, you know, it's, it's driving big culture change for many agencies. It's going to take time to do that. Um, so what can we do in the meantime? You know, for one, I think agencies are, in fact, turning their attention to actually carrying out the evidence building studies that are laid out on these plans. Of course, that's the end goal. And it's been really exciting to see progress in this area. Um, you know, we've emphasized that learning agenda questions should be both short and long term. It, it is really important to generate some evidence quickly, start establishing ways to feed into your typical processes so that eventually it becomes second nature for evidence to have a seat at the decision making table. I mean, if we think back to Lauren's opening, this is the routinization of this. Um, you know, agencies, as, as the panel has noted, you know, we have access to a lot of evidence already, whether it was generated by the agency themselves or by other agencies, outside partners, um, and that can be used right now. So evidence can be used to shape program design, to identify improvements in programs and operations, to determine what is and isn't working well, and then, you know, to answer those questions about why and for whom and under what circumstances. 
Um, think about making use of evidence clearing houses. There's many of these. It's a way to organize the results from studies, synthesize the findings into summaries that are more understandable to a wide audience of practitioners and policymakers. You know, I think that um, these types of sort of meta syntheses can be particularly important in some areas because they demonstrate the value and really the necessity to look at a body of evidence versus trying to make a really consequential, consequential decision based on just a single study. Um, so beyond, you know, beyond the Evidence Act, there's, there's been a lot of momentum and interest around evidence in the past few months. A um, couple of things I want to make sure the audience knows about. So within the first week, uh, the Biden administration issued a presidential memorandum on restoring trust in government through scientific integrity and evidence-based policymaking. Um, the first, the very first sentence stated that it's the administration's policy to make evidence-based decisions guided by the best available science and data. So if you haven't checked that out, um, definitely recommend you do so. There was also an executive order on advancing racial equity and support for underserved communities through the federal government. Um, that includes equity work that all the federal agencies are engaged in right now. Um, it includes an equitable data working group that's kicked off. It's making some great progress in addressing longstanding challenges around equitable data. Um, and as part of this executive order, um, OMB, where I, where I work, we issued a request for information in the Federal Register. So this is one form, not the only form, but this is one form of stakeholder engagement. Um, and the RFI covers a number of topics, um, and it, it really is seeking opportunities and ideas for helping agencies conduct equity assessments and then just overall um, how to best implement this really expansive um, executive order. Um, so again, you know, the RFI, I'll make a pitch. Uh, the RFI is going to be open for public comment through July 6th. Um, and we really do hope to hear and learn from a wide range of voices and perspectives. So please consider submitting public comment if you haven't already. Um, and then finally, to close, I'll just note that, you know, the Evidence Act didn't come with new appropriations. So agencies are looking for partners to help build evidence in key areas. And again, um, do it in a way that is responsive and timely. Those learning agendas are gonna be public documents. So that promotes transparency and accountability, but it's also a great opportunity for researchers and, and partners um, to easily see, you know, what are those priority questions that we're trying to answer? And then align their own research portfolios to help answer those questions, to, you know, to make it more policy relevant. So again, you know, the hope here is that we start to sort of collectively focus on building more evidence in those key priority areas that will ultimately be used to make improvements in policies and programs. Um, I think we're, you know, we're very much in many places just on the, on the beginning stage of all this, but I've been really encouraged by all the great work that's happening. Uh, and I'm very excited to see what comes in the weeks and months ahead. So with that, I think I'm gonna turn it over to Vivian to close us out. Thanks so much, Diana. Um, I really appreciate the wonderful panel we've had and your um, terrific comments, as well as the ones that Lauren started out with. I have just been amazed at how far this conversation about evidence production and use has come in the last decade. I don't think we could have had this conversation a decade ago, or we, we really weren't having this conversation a decade ago. Um, a decade ago, we were thinking a lot about, uh, well, we were having a lot of debates about what constituted evidence and trying to get that definition right. Um, and we weren't really thinking at all about evidence use. Um, there were a lot of assumptions made about what it would take for evidence to be used or what kind of evidence should be used, but we weren't thinking about how to really make it happen. And so it's just refreshing, I would think, that we're finally having this conversation. Um, three thoughts I'd like to um, leave you with. One is, I think there's much more we need to do to learn and to study whether evidence is actually getting used, how it's getting used, and to what ends it's being used for. It struck me that when Molly asked the question of how are you measuring, how are you studying whether the evidence is being used, um, there wasn't a lot of content there to draw upon. And so I think it's really important that we turn our own analytical lens not on just producing evidence for use, but turning that lens on ourselves and say, is the evidence actually getting used? 
How is it being used and to what ends? Is it the ways we anticipate? Is it not? And then how do we improve our evidence use work? So I really want to emphasize that. And as Lauren said at the beginning of this session, there is a actual field of study focused on studying the use of research evidence, drawing together different disciplines and different methods for studying those things. And we need to make that more mainstream. Second, we've kind of danced around this a lot, but we need to think a lot about what it means to build the capacity for evidence use. Because we've been thinking a lot about the capacity to make the evidence more responsive, more reliable, more relevant, more timely. But I don't think we're thinking nearly enough about the decision-making context and how to build the capacity um, of the decision-making bodies, the ones we hope will actually be the users of evidence. You know, what are the decision-making processes? How do we change the ways in which they are set up and ways in which they're structured so that evidence can routinely come into play in shaping decisions. Um, David talked a lot about the bureaucracy and, and I know it's hard to think about changing bureaucracies, but if we're thinking about bureaucracies or government institutions that can routinely take up and use evidence, we inevitably have to think about how do we do some um, change management um, so that they can truly learn from and use evidence in an ongoing way. As Diana pointed out, unfortunately, a lot of the stuff coming down, you know, through the Evidence Act didn't come with more appropriations. So this leaves us with a real dilemma. The federal government has a very big agenda for evidence use, but there aren't additional appropriations. So what does that mean? And so I think um, agencies and offices are gonna think very hard about that. I think that's also a great opportunity for philanthropy to step in and think about public-private partnerships um, to help build the capacity of our government institutions to be learning organizations, to be able to take up and use evidence effectively. Lastly, um, I'd like to pick up on a thread which was about engaging communities. And I think at this time of a racial reckoning across our country, a president who has called out racial justice as a, a pillar of his policy platform, seems like the time is right to really think about this. My colleagues and I have been talking about it as an effort to democratize evidence. Um, and in part, what we mean is the people, the communities that are impacted by government services, by policies that programs actually have a say in the development of the evidence and in how it's used. And if you think about it, it's so actually very rare that the intended beneficiaries of public services are on the front end asked about what they think about the quality of their services. Are they being served in the ways that they'd like to? Nor do they have their hands on the evidence about those services, those programs, and to be able to say what they think the implications are for service improvement, for what gets adopted, what gets de-implemented. And so really thinking about how do we incorporate the basic principles of democracy into this evidence production and evidence use agenda. I, I really think that's probably the leading edge of this, hopefully the next decade of work. And I see that we're running out of time. So I'll end my comments there. And I think I'm turning it over to Basha at the Urban Institute. Thanks Vivian and Diana. And thank you all so much for joining us virtually this afternoon. Um, we really want to thank all of our wonderful presenters and panelists who uh, really put in some very helpful insights on uses of evidence. We also want to especially thank the Annie E. Casey Foundation and the William T. Grant Foundation for their generous support of the forum. And finally, a huge thanks to our co-host today, the Pew Charitable Trust. If you enjoyed this event and would like to learn more about our work, please check out the Federal Evidence Forum at the link in the chat. We host public forums like this one related to all aspects of evidence and evaluation as well as producing briefs and blogs. We also have some resources to provide consultation, webinars, or briefings for individual agencies. So let us know if we can help you as you implement the Evidence Act. On our website, you can also sign up for our periodic newsletter to stay up to date on our events and publications.
A video recording of this event will be available online soon, and we'll be sending out a survey to collect your feedback on the event and what you'd like to see in the future. Thank you all again so much for being here today, and we hope to see you at a future forum soon.